All right. Well, it's 12, so we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Peter Hauk. I'm the community manager for the Zeal Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, but today, I'm your, I'm your MC for this event. Uh, this is the uh, Pitch Prep Hour, uh, sponsored by First Bank and Trust. And we have uh, a couple of people with us today. Uh, one is our uh, featured founder, Nick Farab. Um, Nick is uh, based out of Fargo, and he is the founder of Harvest Profit, uh, which is a company that helps farmers make more profitable farm finance and risk management decisions. Um, Nick raised uh, more than $280,000 in capital, capital from his customers um, to grow his business in 2018, and then uh, sold it ultimately to John Deere in 2020 and continues to work for it uh, today. Uh, and then we also have our featured investor, uh, Matt Paulson of MarketBeat. Um, Matt founded MarketBeat in, uh, oh, I don't have that information, but <laughs> Matt is the founder of MarketBeat, and, uh, which is an Inc. 5000 uh, financial media company that publishes stock market news, uh, data, and research tools. Um, he's the chairman of the Falls Angel Fund, which is a Sioux Falls-based angel investment fund uh, that invests uh, $50,000 to $200,000 at a time in high growth companies in the state of South Dakota, as well as surrounding states. Um, he has personally invested in more than 60 startups and small businesses um, in his time as an investor. Um, so with that, uh, Matt, I'll, I'll throw it over to you if you wanna, wanna kick off your presentation a little bit. Uh, sure. So what we are hoping to accomplish today is kind of give an overview of what it looks like to raise venture capital money for your business and how to do it. So part of what we're going to talk about is you know, who can raise money, who these mystical investor people are, understand like how much money can you raise, how to approach an angel investor, how to get a meeting, and once you get the meeting, what to put in your pitch deck, and then how to follow up after the meeting, you know, all the stuff that surrounds that. You know, I'm kind of going to, going to, going to kind of be the angel investor of the VC side. Nick is going to kind of be the founder side. Nick has raised uh, some money for his startup that he has since went and sold to John Deere. So Nick's kind of been around this once or twice. And, uh, you know, hopefully our diverse perspectives will uh, be helpful to everybody. Uh, and we'll have some time for Q&A as well with the goal of wrapping up by one. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add before we dive into the slides? No, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and look forward to you know, adding my my take, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing people aren't too familiar with me. I've been, you know, in our business in particular, I've been um, a little bit of a critic of the, you know, the traditional venture capital treadmill, um, but that's really just a symptom of, uh, we didn't have a huge uh, need for capital, a really obvious uh, use case for a bunch of capital. But, you know, with that said, there's businesses that are, you know, my business is, is unique and, I come from a world of, I worked for a private equity firm in Minneapolis that had, uh, at the time they had $900 million of capital. And so um, I'm familiar with, you know, boot, from, from bootstrapping to raising a little bit of friends and family money like Harvest Profit did to, you know, to the, the traditional, you know, series A, B, C, D, E, and then, you know, on to, to private equity. And so I uh, well, appreciate the opportunity to be here. If, if I don't mention at the end, if anybody ever has any questions for me, um, Nick Horab at or Nick at harvestprofit.com is the best place to, to get in touch. So thanks for having me here, Matt. Look forward to it. Sounds good. Um, let's, let's see. Let me share my screen with the slide deck that I made. That's screen one. All right. Uh, here is our presentation slide. And kind of the first topic we want to cover is who can raise VC money and why? Uh, so for a company to raise uh, venture capital, meaning somebody is going to make an investment in your business, either for convertible debt or equity and like own part of your business, like this is typically the types of companies that can raise that money. Um, so first uh, we, you know, an angel investor is going to want to see some traction in your business. Uh, they're going to want to see you have a couple of customers. You've got like a working version of your product. Um, they want to see something is happening that's more than an idea, right? Um, they want to see that um, you know somebody other than you has kind of bought into the concept of this business. 
uh, that you're building. And then, um, you know, they will, you know, if you, you're going to build a company and, and an angel investor is going to take ownership in your company and, and give you money to do that, uh, you have to grow pretty big for it to make sense for an angel investor to write a check and, um, you know, make an investment. Uh, most of these investments go to zero and that's just how it is. Um, so for an angel investor to get a return, like they have to have, you know, seven out of 10 investments fail, one or two might break even, and then one out of 10 is gonna do really well and kind of pay for all the losses. So if it's, you know, a restaurant you're wanting to create um, or like a local retail store, like venture capital is not the correct route. You know, that's more of the SBA loan kind of route uh, for those types of businesses. I was just gonna, I was gonna add, Matt, that there's a, a really great book called The Mom Test, which talks about, it's, a lot, it's more on customer development, product development, but it's basically, you know, if you ask your mom if your business idea is good, you know, mm -hmm. she's more than, you know, she's 99%, you know, gonna tell you, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Um, but what people wanna see, you know, one uh, tech, you know, if, if we're talking technology here or e-commerce, stuff that isn't deep tech, it's pretty inexpensive to, to getting an idea uh, off the ground. And so people are gonna wanna see traction like Matt said. And then at the same time, I think the traction is meant to uh, you know, provide objective data around, do people want your idea? Because at the end of the day, you know, you're probably gonna have a lot of people tell you that you have a good idea or that they'll support you, but you need some objective data to, to prove that you're at least on the right track as far as, like Matt said, you know, some sort of revenue growth, uh, you know, product growth. I, you know, I think in the past it used to be, you know, venture capital funded ideas. And now, you know, outside of, you know, biotech or, or really deep technology, you know, people are going to want to see, you know, a minimum viable product in the market, some sort of user traction, some sort of sales traction. And more and more what I'm hearing is, you know, a founder is a pretty good sales, you know, a founder can likely sell their product uh, in a, in a, effective manner. But at the end of the day, are those people actually using the product? So, uh, you know, showing, showing and obtaining user growth and that customers are ultimately getting value from the product is, is, just in much, is just as much or more important, I think, than your ability to generate a few sales. Uh, most of us are passionate enough to generate a few sales for idea, but at the end of the day, it's really, uh, are those customers using your product getting value from it? So I just wanted to add some to that. Number one is just a extremely important bullet point. Yep, along with that, you know, there's gotta be scale to the business that kind of ties into the revenue thing. And um, beyond that, like you have to have a plan for the money that you're raising. You can't just say, I need a million dollars to grow my business. It's okay, why? Why do you need a million dollars? What are you gonna spend it on? Um, what milestones do you think you can achieve with that million dollars um, or whatever the number is? Um, you have to have kind of a budget for that money. Um, the wrong answer is I want to pay myself a salary. Like investors hate that. Uh, they're, they don't want to fund your lifestyle. They want to fund the business. Uh, they want to see you hiring. They want to see you putting money into marketing and product development and things that are going to grow your business. So going on to the next slide. Uh, investors like to see a tech component because that's a thing that scales. Um, and you know, tech companies tend to get great valuations. Um, you know, it's not impossible for a more traditional type of business to get VC money. Um, but investors do like to put money in tech, uh, especially people that are writing high risk, high reward investments. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add at this point? Uh, I would just say that really the, the, the key point there on five, I don't know if you agree with uh, the, this analogy, but you want your business to own the intellectual property. Um, if, you know, there's a lot of great businesses, uh, engineering firms, accounting firms, but a lot of the, you know, the true value in the business is with the people and the people, you know, they know that those relationships are valuable. And so then, you know, they can walk out the door or start their own firm. But really, if you're, if the intellectual property, the true value of the business, you know, lives with the business itself, um, you know, via, you know, the, the quote unquote brand or the code, um, you know, then that's really the, the type of business that venture capital is going to seek. You know, there's 
lots of different professional services businesses, people heavy businesses that are that are you know great sustainable value adding businesses. But um, really, where does that intellectual property live? Does it live with the relationships, or does it live you know in the brand or in the code or in the products? Um, and I think that's a a key point that people are going to be focusing on. So technology, obviously, that you know the IP is in the in the technology you're developing, so it you know checks the box there. Yeah, and along with that, um, investors want to see like a secret sauce that your business has that nobody else has. Um, at MarketBeat, like we're better at um, like lead acquisition for the finance space better than anybody. We've got 2.2 million people on our list. Like that is our competitive advantage. Uh, Nick, um, you know, understood the software in ag markets together in a way that nobody else did, and that was kind of his competitive advantage. Um, you know, if your business is like every other business that's like yours and there's nothing special about it, investors tend not to like that. They want to see something that is kind of a unique advantage that you have that other people don't have, because that kind of gives you a mode around your business that makes it harder for people to copy it uh, or just rip it off. Um, so like try to think about how to communicate, like what's special about your business. Maybe it's intellectual property. Maybe it's um, you've got tech that nobody else has. Um, maybe you've got relationships that nobody else has, you know, those are the types of things that, you know, investors want to see. Yep. And then, uh, finally, like you have to have an exit strategy. If your plan is to run the business forever and not ever sell the business, um, and not pay, you know, dividends, like you have to think about how the investors are going to get their money back. Uh, that means you're going to get sold to a private equity firm. You're going to get sold to another startup or get sold to somebody else. It means you could go public, whether that's by an IPO or by a SPAC or by a direct listing. Um, like you have to have a plan to like grow the business and sell it or go public so that investors can get liquidity. Um, if there's no exit strategy for the investors, like 10 years from now, like they never get paid. Right. So you, you, you've got to think about that. Um, all right, let's talk about um, leveraging kind of the, the, the angel investment network that exists in South Dakota. So about, let's say, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the founders of Dactronics, it's Al Kurtenbach, and I don't remember who the other guy is, uh, they put some money to put together a not-for-profit corporation called the Enterprise Institute uh, with the mission of setting up angel investment funds across the state. Uh, Falls Angel Fund, um, one and two are, one, are two of those funds, uh, but there's also funds in Watertown, in Aberdeen, in Brookings, in Rapid City. Uh, there's previously one in Yankton that's fully invested, um, and there's been a couple statewide funds. Uh, but these funds are there to write checks to high growth companies um, that people think they can scale. Uh, we just got a list of five companies that want to pitch Falls Angel Fund next month. Hopefully we'll hear a couple of them. Maybe we'll write a check. Maybe we won't, depending on you know, how much we like to pitch. But there's a network of angel investors um, in South Dakota. Uh, that's something North Dakota would love to have, and they just don't have for whatever reason. Uh, but these people exist. Um, like in Falls Angel Fund, there's probably 20 people that are angel investors. In the Brookings and Watertown and uh, Rap City ones, there are another 20 in each one of those. So just be aware, like these people are out there. They're not impossible to find. Um, then on, on kind of the later stage money, uh, the state put together the South Dakota Equity Fund a few years ago. Uh, Blaine Christman is the lead on that. They do later stage deals. Um, there's Blue Stem in town. They do private equity. Uh, they're primarily doing ophthalmology stuff. So eye stuff right now, but they do other stuff as well. Uh, but there are angel investors around or is VC money around. It's typically not like, um, there's typically, you know, in startups say there's a lack of capital in South Dakota, but I, I don't really think that's the case. I think the problem is more, um, there's a, a gap between the understanding of what a startup thinks they need to raise money and then what they actually do. Uh, because when the right company comes along, um, you know, the money is there. We heard a tech startup at a last fall's angel fund meeting, uh, there's gonna be a $3 million investment into that startup that will get announced next month. So 
you know, the money, the money's definitely there. Um, it's just, you know, you have to have a good understanding of, of being at the right place to raise that money. Uh, Nick, why don't you talk about these next two points? So what I, what I found that really helped our business and, you know, in addition to uh, raising money, but just the business in general was, you know, I, we didn't have a, a hundred percent transparency when it comes to business metrics and revenue, but I really like the concept of working in public. And so, you know, sharing your progress, you know, I've seen Matt over the years talk about the, you know, how their email list has grown. And so you can just, you know, start to do some math and realize that he's built a pretty nice business there. And, and I'm sure he's gotten, uh, you know, investor inquiries from that. And, you know, on, on top of that, I'm a really big fan of, of LinkedIn, um, you know, for sharing what you're working on, sharing your progress and just starting to, to develop some of those, um, some of those connections. And I think by working in public, you really help uh, facilitate that. Uh, I, I remember I interviewed for a job in New York City and I had a, I had a pretty close to a 4.0 GPA in college. And I, uh, a recruiter asked me, uh, looks like you did, you know, looks like you're doing pretty good in college. And I said, oh, I'm doing okay. And they said, you know, you got to quit that Midwestern modesty. You know, it's okay to, you know, be proud of what you're accomplishing. And, and that really stuck with me here, you know, what, 15 years ago. And so uh, I think a lot of us that come from the Midwest, we don't, you know, we don't like to brag. We don't like to come across as being arrogant, but I really think that, you know, sharing what you're doing in public, you know, sharing your traction, you know, really just starts to push the snowball down the hill on, you know, making connections, getting introduced to investors. And then, you know, just look up, you know, like Matt says, AngelList, you can look up companies that have raised money. Um, you can use, there's Crunchbase or, you know, Google's a pretty good search engine, you know, South Dakota Venture Capital, you know, Series A or South Dakota Seed Investment, South Dakota Angel Investment. You can likely just start to, you know, with five, 10 minutes of, uh, of a dozen different Google search queries, you can start to uncover the companies, you know, in the, in your area, your region, the state, you know, even to North Dakota, Minnesota, uh, people that have raised money and just start to reach out to them. So I think, um, you know, finding companies that have raised money is great. Working in public is great. And, you know, don't be afraid to uh, reach out to people. I don't know how Matt's take on this. You know, my, my particular take on, on people reaching out is um, I tend to prefer email, uh, you know, most of us have plenty of meetings going on. And so, you know, if you emailed me, hey, Nick, I came across your profile on LinkedIn, uh, you know, here's a question, you know, and, and just ask a question. I mean, that would be ideal from my standpoint. And then that tends to, you know, just snowball into, you know, once you develop a little bit of rapport, yeah, I'd be more than happy to meet, you know, we'd be more than happy to meet multiple times and, and, and help you out. But I, the power of the internet um, to share what you're working on and making connections is, is really unbelievable. And, and just don't, you know, try to not be shy. Um, you walk that fine line, you know, there's definitely some arrogance and annoyance and you can pester people, but, you know, don't be shy about connecting with people and, and sharing what you're working on. And if you start to do that stuff in public and reach out to people, you know, that's the snowball that will start to roll down the hill and, you know, lead to more investor connections, but secondly, you know, just helping your business and growing the awareness of, of your business and what you're working on. Excellent. The, the only other thing I'll add to that is one thing that has happened to me as an investor before is, um, so like I invested in a start called Collect, which was the thing that's gonna, was gonna help uh, people manage like their sports card collections. And then other people that were also doing stuff with sports cards reached out and said, hey, uh, we saw that you invested in Collect. That, that to me, that says you're interested in the space. Um, maybe you would like our startup too. So that, that is kind of a, a neat strategy. It's like go on AngelList, look in the industry or category you're in and find other startups doing maybe similar but not exactly the same thing and say, okay, who invested in, in these startups and then reach out to them. All right, let's go to the sure. next slide. 
Um, this is this is a slide that I want to go through a quick, um, like where the money comes from, and like you know that your first fifty grand that you're going to get in a startup tends to come from like your your parents or um, just people that you know that want to place a bet on you. It's typically not because of anything your company has done. Uh, we call this kind of the friends, family, and fools uh, phase of raising money. So like when you're just getting started. You kind of take money from whoever uh, you know that has money and maybe they'll place a bet on you. After that, this is kind of where the Falls Angel Fund network kind of comes into play. Uh, this, these are kind of your first kind of 250,000, first half a million. Like you can raise that money from uh, kind of the angel investor network that's in the state. Um, after that, then you've got to start looking at regional VC firms. Maybe that's Blue Stem, maybe that's South Dakota Equity Partners. There's firms in Minneapolis and Omaha and kind of around the region that will write those bigger checks. And I think eventually we will get another kind of maybe $10 million fund in South Dakota, but that's probably a year, two years, three years out. And then after that, like you got to go after kind of the big kind of VC money kind of sources. And by the time you're in that stage, you'll know who those people are and it really depends on your industry and uh, you'll be getting on a plane and talking to those people. And after that, you, you go public. Um, and that's, that's going to be a, a more common thing for a while. Going public wasn't very common. But with uh, special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs and this kind of new direct listing mod, model that companies are pursuing, um, I think we're going to see more public companies and smaller public companies. So even companies that are maybe, you know, right now you probably need $75 million in revenue to, to go public and I think that's going to dip down to maybe 30, 40 million. Uh, it's based off these new models that are out there. And uh, I think we'll see more, com more startups go public earlier, uh, you know, kind of more like it was in the dot com days 20 years ago um, than it is today. So, um, really, like first getting started, you take that 50K from whoever, and then you kind of work your way down the stack as you need money. Nick, do you have anything to add to this? Well, the other thing I would add is just, Make sure to have a, an attorney that's competent in this startup fundraising ecosystem. You know, I heard a horror story recently where somebody had, you know, they were operating as kind of a, you know, essentially just a self proprietor. Um, you know, they started a, a C Corp using just one of these online corporation creation tools, but they never issued themselves any stock. And so then they went out to raise money and they got a term sheet at, you know, three, $4 million valuation, but they hadn't actually issued themselves the stock. And so when it came to issuing the stock, now it wasn't at, you know, a hundredth of a penny a share, you know, they were, you know, arguably, well, <laughs> according to the, the, you know, the IRS would say that, well, now you have a, you know, you have to go out and get a valuation done by a valuation firm, and they're going to want to know if you've had any offers. And so um, just, you know, the, the building block to all of this fundraising is just to make sure you have your ducks in a row as far as, you know, your entity creation, your stock certificates, and just, you know, having an attorney that's done this before um, is highly valuable. And, you know, that's going to cost, you know, a couple, you know, a, a few thousand dollars likely to, to get started down that route. But I think that can save a lot of, a uh, lot of potential headache for you. But no, I think Matt really nailed the the different stages of, uh, of fundraising here. All right, let's talk about how to get a meeting. Um, the first email you send to investors shouldn't be, you know, can I have some money for my startup? Uh, that tends not to go very well. Uh, Nick, what's your experience with this? You know, I, my, my general experience a lot with all of this was I, I was doing consulting work for farmers and for about 10 years before I started the software. And so I got to know uh, dozens of people who have, you know, seven to eight figure net worths. And I, you know, when I started going out and talking to people about um, raising money, you know, the one thing that I found is I, over, I gave a higher probability to people on their willingness to invest than what I should. <clears throat> and frankly, I really got quickly burnt out. I realized I'm a little more introverted than what I maybe previously thought. And so 
<clears throat> the number of meetings was just kind of burned me out and tired me out. And so uh, the, the one overall theme I'll say here is you're just going to have to have lots and lots and lots of discussions. <laughs> People who you think would, you know, surely invest um, or who've told you they would invest, you know, things will change and they won't or they're just not comfortable. They, they've heard that startups are risky, so they don't want to do it. And so just be mentally prepared to have lots and lots and lots of conversations and, and avoid, just like Matt says here, or the presentation says, you know, don't go out and just, you know, ask for money. Just try to figure out ways that you can, you know, talk to people, build rapport, you know, learn about how they built their business. And, you know, naturally when people, I've had a, I had a call with somebody last week who was, they had a really, they had a couple of really quick questions on email. It was a mark, uh, email newsletters and how we did that at Harvest Profit. And for us, it was, um, they, I could tell they were smart. I liked their business. And so naturally my mind gravitated towards, I wonder if they're raising money. And so you ask for advice, you get money, you ask for money, you get advice, I think is spot on. So be prepared for lots and lots of conversations. And then just try to generally build rapport people at, you know, people generally like to talk about themselves, ask plenty of questions and just naturally the conversation will will move towards uh, fundraising, but really try to build up that rapport first, and you know, be prepared for lots and lots of conversations. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You will have lots of conversations. Um, I, I think one kind of good thing on that is like if you're targeting an investor, you know, look them up on Facebook, look them up on LinkedIn, and see who you have any mutual connections with them. Um, asking for like, if there's somebody I want money from and Nick knows them that I don't like Nick making an introduction email is going to be way more effective than me kind of outreaching cold. Like if we can show there's some kind of mutual warm connection that helps out a lot. Um, so try to do that, try to get an intro meet, you know, meeting. And then you do, you know, you got to ask for the meeting. Um, if you don't ask for, it, you're not going to get one. Um, so and let's we'll, talk about. Go ahead. I, I was just going to add, if if people, you know, some people might have to drop here at twelve thirty, but what we talk about later in the presentation is just, you know, follow the power of following up, the follow the the power of tracking your leads, and just, you know, nobody you're going to talk to is going to be, um, you know, turned off by if you just follow up with them. So if I if you if you have a meeting with an investor. You know, maybe it's not the right time. They just made a, they just bought some real estate. So they don't have capital. You know, if you shot them an update once a month or once a quarter, 99% um, of them are going to be really appreciative and, and really um, impressed by that. And so uh, all these people that you're making connections with, just don't let those, you know, don't let those connections go cold, keep them warm. Um, it'll be greatly beneficial to, you know, just, your company, your network over time to, to keep those connections warm over time. And uh, you know, you're going to invest a lot of time in this process. And, and if you can follow up with those people, you turn that into a, a long-term investment that'll pay a lot of dividends. Great. Um, so once you kind of get a meeting, uh, you know, if it's, if you're meeting with me or another investor, you know, it's a conversation. You do bring a slide deck, you'll probably present it, but that's much more of a kind of, you don't have to worry about the format so much. If you're pitching to a fund or an investor group where, you know, they, you've got your PowerPoint deck and there's a room full of 20 people, you know, it's probably not the first time they've done that. So you really want to ask whoever the organizer is, like, what's the format of, the, of this? Because um, if you, they're expecting to pitch for 20 minutes and then you pitch for 40 minutes, uh, they might not love that. Um, so just ask, like, what is the format of the pitch? Um, you know, for us, we kind of do a 20 minute pitch and then Q and A afterwards. Um, and then you won't kind of unnecessarily, you know, um, let down people's expectations about the format. Um, then if you're going to pitch somebody, Google them, find out everything there is to know about them that you can, you know, what kind of companies have they invested in before? Um, what are the similarities? What are the differences? And then like, what are they personally interested in as well? Like, you know, I, maybe I, maybe I really love sports cards and that's like a thing that I'm into and it might have nothing to do with my business, but you know, it's, it's a passion or something. 
and that can get people to invest if they have that that passion like they'd love to do something with sports cards but don't have time to do it and just want to be part of a business that does that um, there are you know questions that always come up in q a um, kind of be prepared for those um, um, and then you know get your pitch deck ready which we'll talk about next um, Nick, what do you have to say? No, I, I, I think you've nailed it here. Just, you're gonna want to get this. So it's like the, you know, it's like your elevator pitch where, you know, pretty soon you're just not going to have to, you know, practice. It's just gonna roll off your tongue and, and just, you know, get to the point where you can, uh, where, where you can just do these pitches and, and say, you know, it's almost like a sales presentation and, and just do it quick and repeatable and, and learn and experiment. And, you know, don't feel, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, create different presentations and different messaging and, and see what resonates better with investors. And, and just, you know, it doesn't need to be a static pitch. You should be learning from the conversations you're having to, to make your message better. So, yep, that's really all I have to add there. All right, let's talk about what to put in your pitch deck. Um, this has kind of become a very standardized thing and format for pitches. Um, if you go through co-starters, they have a variation of this that you learn on how to do. Um, and it's really kind of everything that needs to be in pitch deck. The first thing is like, what problem are you trying to solve? Like, why does your business need to exist? Um, you know, what's the problem you're solving? How big is that problem? Why does it matter? Um, and I'm trying, hoping, you know, Nick, what, what was the problem you were trying to solve with Harvest Profit? We, in some of my initial material, I had uh, a survey that was done by a large ag magazine that talked about how farmers selling their grain and grain marketing was the the number one challenge on their farm. And so then I kind of dove into what I think the causes of that challenge were and how we were going to address that. So I used some external valid, you know, some external sources of information to objectively highlight that this was a problem. And then I talked about how um, our software can help our customers, you know, combat that problem. So using um, using a combination of uh, industry, you know, third party data uh, combined with the insights and the thesis that I had, uh, I thought was a pretty powerful uh, combination of data to, to tell that initial upfront story. So the next kind of slide is to kind of say, who, who are you selling to, who are your customers? You know, are they male, are they female? What are their age range? Where do they live? You know, what are their psychographic interests? Maybe they're interested in drinking Diet Mountain Dew or maybe they're interested in sports cards or biking or any number of hobbies. So it's really kind of the whole thinking of your customer avatar and you know, what describes my common customer? Uh, what are they interested in? What do they do for a job? Where do they live? Those kind of questions. And the other kind of big question to answer is like, how big is your target market? What is, what is the total sales of your entire industry? How many people um, are in your addressable market? Uh, like for MarketBeat, there is 60 million people that um, are self-directed investors in the United States. That means they own single stocks. Like that is MarketBeat's total addressable market. We've got 2.2 million from my email list. So we've got 57.8 million to grow yet. Um, you know, Nick, how, how did you describe your target market? Um, we used, there's some census data that's done by you know, the USDA and the Canadian government provide a census of farmers by revenue size. And so we, we use that data to identify the, the target market. And then we could, you know, in our industry, in our industry, it was just kind of commonly known that there wasn't any, uh, any competing alternatives that had, you know, won a, you know, a material share of the market. So it was, you know, there's 150,000 farmers in the U.S. and Canada. Um, 
most of them are doing none of this analysis. The ones that are doing this analysis are using spreadsheets. And so, you know, you can, you know, we could back down and say, I'm not a big fan of the, you know, the addressable market math on there's 150,000 farmers in the U S if we can capture this percentage of them at this amount of revenue, what our business size is. I, uh, I think that, you know, that math, you know, makes sense and it's obvious. Um, but, you know, thinking about it reverse on, you know, how many customers do we have today? How many customers can we grow? You know, what kind of traction have we grown towards, you know, that total addressable market math that everybody likes to do. But we used, uh, once again, we, we used uh, industry uh, government research to define the target market. We didn't do any personas, you know, in hindsight, I probably should have like laid out, you know, he, you know, there's definitely a few different personas that we could have gone after. Then that starts to starts to paint the vision of, you know, all right, a younger, more progressive farmer versus a, an older, more established farmer. You know, those two personas, how do you market to them? Um, what do they want to see in your product? Um, that was definitely an area of improvement that I could have done. Okay. Next thing is like kind of the alternatives, competitors that are out there, you know, who's trying to solve this problem now and maybe talk about like why um, those solutions fall short. Like why aren't those solutions good enough now? Um, you know, Nick, like for your business, like you could say right now, the farmer just goes to the grain elevator and sells their stuff, but that's not good enough because yep. they could not be getting the best price for their, their wheat or their corn. Yep. Yep. And then after that, you talk about what your solution is. You know, this is kind of where you talk about like what you're building, what your product is, um, you know, how your product is better than what's out there now. And, you know, what are your thoughts on the market that maybe the existing solutions don't, um, don't kind of really believe in. Um, so uh, like at MarketBeat, like we, uh, we publish kind of personalized stock research tools that are tailored to people's stock portfolios. So, you know, another business might believe that everybody wants the same information about the stock market. We might say, you know, everyone is interested in different stocks and we want to give them information based off the stocks that they are interested in, not just every stock that's out there. Next kind of thing is kind of the go-to-market strategy. You know, what is your marketing strategy? How are you going to let customers know about your product or service? Um, how are they going to buy your products? Are they going to just go to your website and check out? Do they need a sales meeting? Are you going to go knock on people's doors and um, you know do sales? Like, what does that look like? And then, how is your product kind of delivered? Is it a, a SaaS app? Is it an email newsletter? Is it a piece of software? Is it um, you know, is it a consulting thing? Like how, like, how do they actually get the thing, um, you know, and, and make use of it and get benefit from it? Nick, do you have anything to add? No, nope, that, you know, just trying to, you know, paint that, paint that vision of how you're going to go from, a, you know, here's the total market size, uh, to you know how you're going to start to you know, chip away and, and acquire those customers, and obviously on the next slide here we'll talk about the ever important concept of you know the goal of a business is generating revenue, mm -hmm. and um, what what traction can you show uh, that has you know that has increased the confidence that you have and that your investor should have that you're able to you know continue to chip away at that uh, you know getting your solution in front of and helping more people. So yeah, you, you know, you always slide about how you know, how your business is going to make money. You know, what are you going to charge for your product? You know, at MarketBeat, we have two kind of tiers of premium product. We've got the free subscription, and you've got your we've got a paid subscription that's twenty dollars a month, or and a paid subscription that's forty dollars a month. So uh, customers will pay us via recurring payments through credit cards through Stripe, and like if you have recurring income, like you want to mention that because investors find that very valuable because it's kind of guaranteed revenue almost in a way. Um, 
so kind of talk about your pricing, you know, what people get for that pricing, what does that look like? And then they're gonna to wanna to see that, like, what are your kind of unit economics? Like what, you know, if I sell a marketing subscription for $40, what does it cost me on a, you know, one off, you know, for each additional one, what does that cost me? And am I making money on that? The other thing I'll add here is, you know, the, the, the stickiness of your recurring revenue. Um, you know, at, at Harvest Profit, we had approximately 90% annual revenue retention. And so we had a, you know, 10% of our customers would, you know, would cancel their subscription in a year. Um, investors will want to know that if you have a, you know, a usage based pricing a per user or, you know, per gigabyte download, you know, you might build a business where, you know, you lose 5% of your customers a year, but the ones that stay each purchase, each purchase 20% more from you. So you have, you know, net negative revenue churn where your current customers continue to buy more and more, you know, those are powerful levers to know. And, and, and you know, maybe at the seed stage aren't quite as important, but just knowing this, you know, as you, if you get into a, you know, a true seed round with, you know, an angel fund or series A, um, people are going to really want to peel back the onion and look at, you know, how long have your customers been with you? How long have they been paying you? And then, you know, a side note, if you could ever get to the point where you, your current customers continue to pay more and more revenue, that's the holy grail. And that's where your valuation just explodes. So understanding the, all the different levers that go into revenue and recurring revenue is, is really important because um, the, the more money you look to raise, that's what they're going to be really focused on. And if you can build that, that magical business where your current customers pay you more, um, then you're really on to something. Okay, the next slide is kind of your team. Um, you know, talk, this is where you got like set aside the Midwest nice kind of stuff and Midwest humility kind of stuff and really talk up who you are and your experience and your team's experience. Uh, you want the investors to think you've got the best team in the world to solve your problem. And you talk about your degrees, talk about your prior work experience, talk about your knowledge areas um, and really kind of, you know, talk up who you are and who your team is. And then if you have a board of directors, you want to name those people too, because um, there was a company that pitched uh, Falls Angel Fund, not going to name them. But I think if the founders had come in by themselves without kind of their board, like we probably would have said no, but given who was on their board, they were people that we knew, liked and respected. We, we wrote them a check based off who their board was. So, you know, having a board of advisors, directors that have some well-known names in the community, like that, that can help a lot, it can make a difference. And then next slide is, you know, what have you kind of done so far in your business in terms of traction? You know, do you have a first customer, a second customer? How built out is your product? You know, what kind of market research have you done? You know, what, I mean, has, this is kind of what Nick said, has anybody but your mom like said something nice about your startup? Um, you, know, have, you know, what have you achieved so far? Nick, do you have anything to add on either of these two? No, no, I think, you know, the, the general comment on the, the, the Midwest humbleness, you know, just don't be afraid to, you know, highlight strengths. And yeah, I think if you can, yeah, I, nothing material to add. Excellent. Well, let's try to blow through the next couple of slides because I don't have time for Q&A. Um, it, it's good to show some other companies that have, have sold or exited. Uh, their businesses before. So if you can say, you know, market beats in the financial newsletter space, um, Beacon Street Services just did a SPAC and they were worth $500 million. Um, the Hustle was another newsletter they just sold for whatever million dollars they sold for. And like showing some of those examples are a good thing. And then showing some potential acquirers, like who in your space is acquiring company like yours. So that gives investors some kind of concept of like what the end game is and that you are thinking about how you're going to pay them back someday. Um, often companies think like, oh, I just need the money. I need to focus on the money. Um, but you also need to think of focus on like how you're going to give the money back someday. Um, and then you have a slide kind of what you're looking for money, you know, how much money are you trying to raise? What valuation and terms are you looking for? You know, or do you want to do an equity round, a convertible debt round? If you don't know, you say you don't know. 
and then have you raised any money already if you have raised on like some other money already that's a good thing because nobody wants to be the first dollar into a startup um, people like to invest with other people because um, if i'm the only person that thinks it's a good idea you know then i worry like is it really a good idea but then if i hear that i don't know two other people i know have, have invested in the startup it's like well if we're, if we're done, we're all going to be done together and lose money as a group. And it's not just me kind of going out on a limb and then kind of talk about how you're going to use the money. Um, and then, um, yeah. And at the end, you'll kind of have a Q and a slide and ask. Um, yeah. Uh, Matt, are, are you, Go ahead. Are, are you seeing these safe convertible notes being common, commonly used in, in your deals that you come across? It's becoming more common. SAFE um, is an acronym, by the way. It's not meant to say, it's not meant to mean that they're, you know, yeah, SAFE. It stands for Simple Agreement for Future Equity. And it was pioneered by the Y Combinator people because there are some problems with convertible debt um, that make things more complicated than they need to be. And basically what a SAFE is, it says, Whenever you have a price drown, um, so like your company's worth $10 million, I'm going to take 20% of that. Like whenever that happens, I'm going to get a piece of it and I'm going to get a discount for investing early. Um, but it's kind of a good way to do it when you don't know what your company is worth today. One challenge that I had is we did a convertible note in Harvest Profit and I overthought a lot of the terms and made it a little more complicated than what it needed to be. And because we, did, we didn't have a lead investor, so it was basically, you know, everybody kind of thought, felt like they were making their own decision. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I probably should have went out and, and got a lead, you know, a lead angel investor. So then you can go to other investors and say, you know, so-and-so or a certain entity is, is gonna lead this round. You know, we've agreed to these terms with them rather than trying to, you know, have to pitch every, you know, everybody's going to want to know your deal structure, but I think my process could have been simple, much more simple if I would have had a, a lead investor in place um, that, you know, gave, you know, small investors comfort that, you know, they weren't the one that, you know, they weren't solely, you know, each one of these people weren't making individual decisions. It was, it was you know, more of a, a collective group of people. So. Um, okay, let's, I feel like there are a few mistakes that like people make all the time. Um, one is trying to raise money too early. Um, the reality is that when you kind of co-pitch falls in your fund, people rarely get a second chance because there are so many people that want to pitch our, our fund that like if you didn't get it the first time, it's probably not, you're probably not going to get a second shot. Um, it's pretty rare that happens. So you want to raise like start asking for money when you're at the right stage. And that tends to be kind of that first or second customer stage. Um, if you do it too early, people, you know, you could kind of lose your shot there. Um, the, other, the other thing I hear a lot is like, here's the market size. If we get 5% of the market, we're going to be this great business. Um, you know, that's kind of a big assumption. And if you're not really saying anything at all um, by doing that, so just don't say that. Another, another phrase that I hear all the time that kind of drives me nuts is, these are conservative estimates. Like all of that means is you made up some numbers and you took 20% off the numbers that you made up and said they're conservative. Uh, I wouldn't say that out loud. And then another thing that I, I see a lot is companies that ask for evaluation based off what your company could be um, years down the line and not what it is today. So you, you really have to like, if you're raising money today, you've got to raise money based off where your business is at today, not where you think it's going to be at three years from now because there's a lot of things that can happen over that three year period. And if I'm writing you a check today, that means I can't put that money to work for the next three years. So you can't ask me to pay for your business based on what it is three years from now um, when it's just not there yet. And then finally, you know, it's not like Shark Tank, you're not gonna negotiate a deal right then and there. Um, it tends to be a drawn out process. You might say, this is kind of what we're thinking. And then like a week later, the investor might follow up and say, yeah, you know, maybe how about this? And there's a back and forth and the negotiation that happens. And it's, it's not like a one, one and done kind of conversation. Nick, do you have anything to add to these things? No, just to, to keep it concise, we can just keep rolling. Yeah. 
uh, after you make a pitch, uh, you send an email thanking them for the opportunity to pitch. And then you say, hey, we'd love for you to make an investment in our company. Um, are you interested, question mark? Um, and they might say yes, no, maybe. I feel like maybe is the most common answer. Um, and kind of at that point, you just gotta keep asking until you get a yes or a no. Uh, put them on your email uh, distribution list, start sending them updates about your company. Um, sometimes people are like a no now, but like down the line, like they might be a yes if they like the progress they see. And then finally, uh, just a few realities um, of what raising money actually is. Um, it, it takes a while. It's a slow process. It's hard. A lot of people that try to raise money can't raise money because they haven't made the progress that investors want to see. Um, if you think you're going to need money six months from now, you start raising money today because it just takes that long. You know, as Nick mentioned, you know, you've got to pitch a lot of investors to get money. Um, you know, it tends not to be one investor that writes you a check. It tends to be money split up between between five and ten people, because um, there aren't a lot of investors that are going to write like a half a million dollar um, check at a time. But you might get ten people that write fifty thousand dollar checks. Um, no, is it? You know, no today is a no forever. It can change over time, and. You do have to think about it, it's like a sales process. You are selling your business to investors. So you gotta do lots of tracking and follow up and say, okay, I reached out to Nick a week ago. Uh, he's still interested. So I'm gonna follow up and say, hey, here's some cool stuff we did this week. Uh, we'd love to have you invest and you know, ask again. And you definitely need an attorney that does this stuff. Um, there is an attorney that follows Angel Fund Works with that might be good at this, I'm not actually sure. Uh, but you definitely want an, an attorney um, that helps startups write up the paperwork. You don't want to, if you're like the, if you're working with a general business attorney or an attorney that's, that does a little bit of everything that's like not the right route for this, you really want somebody who has done um, investment rounds before. Nick, do you have anything to add to these? No, I just think the, you know, it's easy to remember the first five or 10 conversations you have, but if you start to you know, talk to a hundred people, if you're not tracking those conversations, you're gonna you're gonna lose track of things and forget things and, and maybe lose out on a, a valuable connection. And then I used I was a little bit shocked at just how the I had very marginal experiences with a handful of attorneys until we went with a, you know I think kind of a regional top tier firm called Gray Plant Moody, and so I would be. You know, I would have high expectations when it comes to attorney and make sure they've worked on deals. Matt said it's just super important. I think our attorney was just, you know, ridiculously high hourly rate. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like we just had everything. Like we went through selling our company to a a uh, hundred billion dollar publicly traded entity, and we had no issues with our legal documents. And so, um, you know, that extra. Oh, $150 an hour we spent had a very large ROI in my opinion. So that's a good, good legal counsel is very important. Good. Well, we'll do some Q and A, but if people have questions, my email is just matt at mattholson.com. Nick's is nick at harvestprofit.com. Feel free to reach out to either of us. And thank you to our friends over at Emerging Prairie for helping us organize and promote this event. And then Startups Who Fall is kind of our group uh, I'm going to turn off my slides and then kind of go into some Q&A time. It does look like there are a few questions um, in the chat. It uh, looks like a few people have asked about kind of valuation. Um, uh, ben Whitley, or if you're around, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, my question is on how to think about valuation in the in the seed stage like what's and and further like what's the minimum share of a company that's interesting for a, a regionally a regional angel fund you know what, what i did when it came to valuation was i you know i googled you know seed seed stage valuations 2018 <laughs> and then you just you know you get a report and you know i think it was you know 
high seven figures was the average valuation um, in, you know, in the, in, that was overly weighted to Bay Area companies. And so, you know, for my business, I did, I did a rel relatively complicated convertible note, but, you know, at the end of the day, your investors probably going to want, you know, you're probably going to be diluting your company 10 to 25%. And so then you back into what kind of investment round you're looking to raise. So then if you go to Matt's slide where it was, you know, 250 to $500,000, you know, you can kind of re reverse engineer the math there on, you know, if you're selling 10% of your business and getting $250,000, you know, that's a two and a half million dollar valuation, um, you know, which is probably, you know, in the ballpark, you know, maybe a little low for, for what you'd be seeing for a, you know, a, a true tech company. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's really a mix of art and science with a lot of art. And uh, uh, for me, I actually, I, gave, I ended up giving our investors a little bit of a lower valuation because I wanted it to be a, a good investment for them. And, you know, that weighed pretty heavily on me is, you know, I want them to look back and think that, yeah, geez, I wish I should have done more. And so I was willing to take a little bit of extra dilution, but Google's your friend. And at the end of the day, the market will tell you as well. So people like, you know, the angels funds that do a lot of deals, they'll give you some insight and tell you pretty quickly if you're, uh, you know, if you're too, if you're, if you're too far off one way or the other, but you know, Google's your friend when it comes to looking at valuations to, you know. Yeah. Matt, any thoughts? I mean, for companies that are just getting started, first customers, you know, two to five million is kind of common around here and giving up 10 to 25% based off progress and how much money you need is, is common. Uh, but it is kind of, uh, I'm investing in this startup that had a, we set the valuation at $10 million and we both kind of thought like, well, we both know we're just kind of picking a number out of thin air and it felt good to everybody. So that's kind of what we went with. So um, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of that that goes on, right? Yes. It is really, and it's a negotiation too. It's not just a, and it tends to be set by your largest investor, your lead investor. They tend to set that and then the smaller investors just kind of have to take or leave that deal. Um, let's answer one more question and then we uh, need to kind of head over or let, uh, or have somebody from First Bank and Trust um, talk for a minute. Um, does anybody- uh, Somebody said recommended CRM. I think HubSpot has a pretty decent free CRM that a lot of people are using. You know, be aware they'll upsell you on lots of stuff, but that's a pretty established player. Pipe Drive, Google Sheets is a pretty decent CRM for a beginning stage company. And there are some questions we didn't have time to get to, so feel free to reach out to either of us and we can try to answer them for you. Uh, Sadie Jo Bell, are you on the call with us today? I am, thank you, Matt. You hey, Sadie. I am, yeah. I'm going to keep this brief. I hate to be um, taking up time for Q&A. What a great call. There was a lot of valuable information um, that I even took away here. So I guess I'll, I'll start out by introducing myself. I'm Sadie Bell. I work with First Bank and Trust, which is a local community bank um, located throughout South Dakota. Our headquarters are in Brookings, uh, but we have a presence throughout the state uh, and a larger presence here in Sioux Falls as well. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to partner with Zeal to Brienne and the Zeal team. Uh, and thank you to Matt and Nick for all the information that you shared today, along with providing the education, support, mentorship uh, that you guys do to the entrepreneurial community. Um, we couldn't do this around here without experts like you. So, so thank you. We certainly recognize as a community bank how important and how much value entrepreneurs bring to the community. So it's just really exciting to see how much uh, wind and headway has come along uh, due to folks like you providing this information. Um, and we're just excited to see this kind of continue to grow and, and move forward in the years to come. If there's anything we can do for any of you at the bank, um, if we can provide connections, other advice, um, we're happy to do so. I know Brienne's got my contact information and I can certainly share it with Matt as well. Uh, so feel free to reach out. With that though, I'll turn it over. Thank you guys. Oh, great. We'll turn it back over to Peter and Peter can thank our sponsors and tell us about what other events are coming up. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. This was a, this was a great session here today. Um, uh, 
as far as upcoming events, we have every Wednesday we have One Million Cups here in Sioux Falls. And uh, it sounds like Fargo just announced a startup brew, uh, which is a, a once weekly uh, meeting much like One Million Cups that they'll be putting on um, with some, some fun twists. Uh, then on April 29th, uh, from 4 to 6 p.m., we have the Sioux Empire Student Showcase, which is being put on by some uh, students at USF. Um, and then May 6th from 8 to 9, we have a uh, virtual startup pitch night, uh, which will be sponsored by the Falls Angel Fund. Um, that's some of our uh, co-starters participants will be participating in. Um, and then on May 13th, we have uh, Morning Mingle from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. And then the last thing I want to remind everybody about is uh, May 20th, uh, from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m., we have Hey Sioux Falls. Um, and nominations for that are due April 16th. That's kind of the uh, Sioux Falls Entrepreneurial uh, Awards Show. So be sure to head to heysiouxfalls.com and make those nominations uh, before that deadline. Um, yeah, like, like I said, a uh, special thanks to uh, our friends over at First Bank and Trust uh, for, for making today's event possible. Uh, but then also thank you to all of our sponsors uh, for making it possible for us to put on uh, events at all. And uh, those sponsors are uh, Voice Law Firm, Ide Bailey, First Bank and Trust, First National Bank in Sioux Falls, First Premier Bank, Interstate Office Products, ISG Architects, Market Beat, Matt's company, uh, Midco, Midwest Employee Benefits, MSH Architects, NAI Sioux Falls, Nelson Commercial Real Estate, Susan CPA, and Tiger 29. Thank you all for joining us here today. This was a, this was a really informative session, uh, and we're uh, glad to, that we got all you on here over the uh, lunch hour. So everyone have a great rest of your day. <laughs>